Um, so my name is Peter Ann Zimmerman. I am the program advisor for the Postgraduate Infection Prevention and Control Program here at Griffith University. I'm also a visiting research fellow with the Gold Coast Health Service um, and I have a, a few other different hats that I wear in other settings. But I do work for the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network with the WHO as well. So outbreak response and infection control are my specialty and I have a Doctor of Public Health as well. That's me in a nutshell. So um, if any of you, after you finish your nursing degrees, are interested in doing infection control as a career path, um, I'm the person that you'd, you would talk to. Okay. All right. So um, now the lecture that we're going to do today is just around infection prevention and control. So who knows what infection prevention and control is? Hand hygiene, that's one important aspect of it, unfortunately the bane of my existence. So it is basically from one person to another, particularly in healthcare settings, that's what we look at with infection control. However, with infection control, it's not only healthcare settings, it can also be within the community as well, okay? So infection control, a lot of people think infection control is about acute care facilities, that's not true. Infection control is actually every part of our lives every day. It's even to us washing our hands after we've been to the bathroom. It's even us being vaccinated for flu vax. It is washing our hands before we eat our food. Okay, it's as simple as that. It's vaccinating our dogs and our cats and our pets. Okay, it's all of these things. So it is about looking after each other. It's about healthcare worker safety just as much as it's about patient safety. Okay, so a lot of people will say, oh, it's the infection control, it's all about the patient. It's actually not. It is equally about you as healthcare workers. Okay, so it is all, it's about protecting ourselves, protecting each other, and also protecting our patients. All right, so by the end of this, you should be able to have a general understanding of the importance of infection control practices, and you'll hear, particularly me, who, I mean, I've worked in infection prevention and control for um, 20 years. Okay, so um, I have a tendency to default back to just infection control, but generally we do talk about it as infection prevention and control. Okay, so just make that clear. I might use the term infection control, but when you're writing your assignments and things, it's infection prevention and control. Okay, I'm just gonna put that up there now. I just, I'm old school with this. And so it's about the principles, the practices, why it's important, how we do it. Okay. He went and just had some blood tests and at that stage we were all thinking that it would just be a general viral illness. They weren't sure what type of leukaemia he had. But they anticipated we would be an inpatient in hospital for roughly about a month. Within about a 24 hour period Glenn had had a Hickman's line inserted and chemotherapy had been started. It seemed like every infection that Glenn could get, he got, and the worst of them. Then he got the MRSA bacteremia. We believe that the majority of catheter-related bloodstream infections are preventable. In fact, in centres that stick to the best practice guidelines, they have rates approaching zero. I got a phone call from his mum saying that they'd had a met call on him and he was dropping his blood pressure and he was going off to ICU with this MRSA bacteremia. I guess you have times where um, you see him really, really unwell and you think that, you know, he's, he's going to be okay, he has to be okay, he has to just keep fighting it. Preventing 
catheter-related bloodstream infections in the healthcare setting is everyone's business. So clearly the people who are inserting the lines, through the people who are managing the lines on a daily basis, teams that are involved in consulting on patients are involved, but the managers in the critical care areas and in the rest of the hospital are also involved. But most importantly, the CEOs and Board of Management needs to take this on as an absolute priority as well. And I do remember the day that the haematologist walked in and said that Glenn had his neutrophils back, that his immune system was coming back and he was still here with us and that was just like, you know, the, the biggest blessing like she was coming to tell us the news that we've been waiting for. It's quite incredible that I survived and certainly I treasure life at this stage. Uh, I really have no long-lasting uh, side effects as a result of my inpatient stays. So despite those complications, I've come out fit and fighting at the other end. Look, there's an ancient dictum in medicine that first we should do no harm. I think sometimes as clinicians, doctors and nurses, we forget when we're concentrating on the problem at hand in front of us, that actually what we regard as relatively minor things like hand hygiene or aseptic, aseptic technique, if not observed, may have devastating consequences for the patient and their family down the track. I think it's really important to recognise that wholeheartedly we are there to advocate for patients and advocate for the best care for patients. And having dealt with that, you know, firsthand as a personal experience, uh, I feel that, that I try and make that the most important thing in my job. The thing to remember with this and why I show that video is that it is, it can happen to anyone and it can happen any time, okay? And the thing is that our role as clinicians is to prevent it from actually happening in the first place. I don't know if any of you have got healthcare families or anything like that, but I'm afraid to tell you that, and I do have a healthcare family, if anything's going to go wrong, it's going to happen to someone who works in healthcare, <laughs> okay? So just saying that, just putting that out there now. That's been my experience, um, but, um, and, and most of my friends. Um, but it is just important that we do these things. Things as simple as just cleaning a port properly before you actually insert something into a, a cannula. Washing your hands, using the alcohol hand drop, these are so important. And these are the things that are often missed. Okay, and there's usually all sorts of reasons why people don't do the right thing when it comes to infection control. Okay, uh, it's too busy, there's not enough staff, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do this. But it can be something as simple as not washing your hands that can end up with somebody with an MRSA, MRSA sepsis and possibly kill them. Okay, we are not at a point in our technology where we can trace it back to one individual incident where it's happened. But, you know, maybe one day down the track, there will be a time when we'll be able to say it was because that person did not wash their hands. So in the meantime, we have to take that accountability. I don't want to be in a situation where that's the kind of surveillance we have to do on healthcare workers to find out where problems actually occur. I don't want to work in that kind of world. But the thing is, we have to be accountable to ourselves and to each other, okay, and to our patients around this. So healthcare associated infections are preventable. Sure, there's going to be patients who have got all these pre-existing things which are going to make them a sitting duck, okay? Glenn, for example, he had no neutrophils. He had nothing looking after his immune system. It was gone. It was shattered. Okay, so he was a sitting duck, all right? You've got most of your patients these days will have a comorbidity, okay? High-income countries, their lifestyle diseases, their things like diabetes, heart disease, things like that, obesity, all right? These things will make people more prone to having an infection and a healthcare associated infection. Um, common sense, a lot of people, when I talk to people about infection control, they say, oh, that's just common sense. 
apparently not common enough. That's why we still have healthcare associated infections and we have transmission of disease. And these things are actually quite simple. Um, and it is part of everything we do. If you think about infection control, at, like the brakes on your car, it is there to stop you from having an accident or hitting something, right? The brakes on your car, all right? Or a seatbelt, it's a safety mechanism, all right? Imagine taking the brakes off the car. Would you stop? Infection control are like brakes on a car. It's to stop things, okay? It is, stop, is there to stop transmission of infection, okay? It is not the optional extra of, you know, heated leather seats in the front, all right? It's not that, even though that's nice, <laughs> okay? But it is about the brakes on the car. These are brakes. These are things to stop bad things from happening to people, including you. All right, so these are just some statistics, and I won't go into it, but it is a significant issue. In high-income countries like Australia, we have, well, relatively speaking, you know, when you think about it, they say, what, 7 to 10% of patients will acquire one or more healthcare-acquired infections. In lower-income countries, you can double that at least. Okay, I actually work in a lot of low- and middle-income countries, um, specifically around the Pacific and Asia, and we're looking at a much higher incidence in those countries. But here, we have the resources, we have the training, we have everything available, but still we hit about 7 to 10%. So, and if you put this in terms of people and individuals, there's at least 7,000 people dying a year related to healthcare-associated infection. Most of these, like 99.9% .9 of these, would have been preventable. So there is, you know, things about costs, you know, how much it costs the healthcare system, all that sort of stuff. But I am one of these people, and for someone who does public health, probably, you know, shouldn't think this way, but I am actually about the individual. Imagine the individual cost to each and every one of those people who die or become ill or severely incapacitated because they ended up with a healthcare-associated infection. And treating these healthcare-associated infections is long and arduous and, like, literally painful for so many patients. I remember I had a patient once who um, she had an infected total hip joint. She was, I think she was about 90 odd. Um, I had her in our ward probably for a good six months. Um, she actually had to have the, the, the hip replacement removed. What they did is they ended up taking the replacement out and having to put a, a cement block into her hip joint to put a space between what was left of her femur and her hip, okay? And that was an antibiotic impregnated cement block. Can you imagine the pain of having a cement block in your leg or in your hip for a good six months later again? That was to get rid of a MRSA infection. That lady never left that hospital. She never left our ward. Well, not walking and not breathing anyway. She passed away on the ward. So these things do affect people and they are extremely painful. So have a think about the individual cost to a patient, okay, to their families. Imagine if it was you. Okay, so there are a number of things that will affect um, whether a person gets a healthcare associated infection and us as clinicians, our role is to prevent these things causing an issue. Okay, so virulence of an agent, so that's how infectious the actual pathogen might be. So if the bacteria, the virus, the fungi, whatever. So we don't have a lot of control over that, <laughs> okay? Um, but we do in a way when it comes to antimicrobial stewardship, which is a different talk from another day. Um, patients' comorbidities, okay? So we talked about those things before. Things that could influence their immune system and how they can react to an infection or not. Okay, or prevent an infection. What is the most important thing that we have individually that protects us from infection? The most important, the first line of defense. Skin, exactly. What do we do in healthcare? What do we do to people's skin all the time? We stick things in it, <laughs> okay? We put holes, sutures, we put all sorts of cuts into skin, okay? We are the ones actually opening up there's a first line of defense constantly and creating a potential portal of infection, okay? And so we've got a responsibility to fix that. So wounds and devices are so important, okay? So how we manage a wound, 
how we look after a device, so, you know, having a cannula. Um, it can even be something like, well, you know, you've got your big stuff like central lines and surgery and all that stuff. But the other thing to remember is even things like respiratory equipment. Okay, if the respiratory equipment that we use on a patient isn't clean, they could actually inhale an organism. So you have to think about it not just in the holes that we create, but also the, the holes that are actually already there. And usually we are sticking things in the holes that already exist as well. So we have to be careful with that. And that's where aseptic technique comes in and also where good cleaning, disinfection and sterilisation is really important as well. And we talked about immune status, age. Can someone tell me what the problems are with age? So the older you are or the younger, exactly. So, so that's why we do vaccinations and so forth, particularly on younger kids, because they don't have the immune system to protect them. Okay, and that's why we also make sure that people are vaccinated who are around younger children. And of course, the elderly, your immune system suffers a bit as you age. So it's my birthday this month, so I'm just getting a bit nervous about this myself. <laughs> um, I'm feeling old today. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, this, your immune status and your age have a lot to do with it. Okay, and these are all interconnected. They don't all sit on their own. So whether you've got a wound or a device, and then if you have, you're an elderly person and you've got comorbidities, you're increasing your risk every time. So just keep that in mind. And a lot of our patients are elderly now, okay? And they're coming in with comorbidities. So that makes them much more risk of a healthcare associated infection. Okay, so in your textbooks and that stuff, you'll have what the, what the model of the chain of infection is. So you need these six things to be able to transmit an organism from person to person, all right? Now, how infection control or infection prevention and control works is that we put a break in between one thing to the next. So our idea is to actually break the chain. And infection control pr practices do that. Okay, that is how infection control works. We actually disrupt the chain. We put hand hygiene in place. We put personal protective equipment in place. We isolate patients. Okay, there's all these practices that we use to break the chain. All right, so how are infections spread? All right, so there's some main ways that we look at in regards to this. So, all right, airborne organisms. So airborne or droplet. Now, there is a distinction between the two. Airborne is when it actually is a very, very tiny organism or a particle. It actually will float on air currents. It doesn't have to, it, it's not actually really heavy at all and it won't fall to environmental surfaces. Usually an airborne organism, you have to inhale to actually become infected. Yeah, so all you have to do is just breathe, okay? And then you breathing in, that's how you could actually get it. Droplet organisms are actually larger particles. These will float for a little bit, but generally are large enough that they will fall to inanimate surfaces. So bench tops, keyboards, all that sort of stuff, really high, can be highly contaminated with a droplet organism. All right, so aerosols can actually, like I said, like droplets, which is like sneezed and so forth, they can come out, go a certain distance, but then will generally drop. Um, just the little particles that will float on the air currents and sneezing. Okay, TB, what is that, airborne or droplet? Beautiful, exactly. TB is an airborne organism. You have got to inhale it. So influenza, is that airborne or droplet? Droplet, beautiful, yeah. So you're looking at, the, again, the larger particles which are being coughed out, sneezed out, out, those sorts of things, going to fall to inanimate objects. So if it's fallen to an inanimate object, then how am I going to get sick? Touching it, and then what do I do? So touching your face, so I'm looking at everyone who's touching their face right now, or has been just in the last minute or so, and there's a lot of you. Can anyone tell me what you touched like five minutes, ten minutes ago? Do any of you go to the bathroom? Handles, yeah. All right, direct contact. Okay, so direct contact is through hands, environment, and fomites. What's a fomite? So usually inanimate objects. Yeah, exactly. So even, yeah, clothing can be contaminated, bench tops, things like that. All right, give me some organisms. Gastro can be contact, yes. It can be drop, it can be, depends on the organism. Some of them are tricky. Some of them fall into more than one category. MRSA. Okay, so does everyone know what MRSA is? So MRSA is, okay, so on our skin, we have this organism, this bacteria all the time. We all have it. It's called Staphylococcus aureus. 
We are continually and always colonised by microorganisms, okay? We wouldn't be as healthy as we are if we didn't have them, actually. But sometimes they get a little out of control, and sometimes they can, like when we have antibiotics, and so it can play up with our gut, right? Um, but equally, if you have organisms on your skin, so the, the normal Staph aureus, sometimes they be, can become resistant to a group of antibiotics, okay? So mainly the methicillin type antibiotics, so things like penicillin. So MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. <laughs> it's just a small title. <laughs> okay, and we've got all these really, really big names, okay? But yeah, so methicillin resistant, sometimes we call it multi-resistant because it's not only the penicillin-based drugs that it's resistant to. Okay, there can be actually more. Okay, so, but generally speaking, MRSA, and so, for example, Glenn's story, he had an MRSA bacteremia, which means that his blood was infected with Staph aureus, which was resistant to methicillin, okay, which basically sent him into septic shock. All righty. Um, and so there's a lot of other antibiotic-resistant organisms, okay, when we'll cover a couple of them a little bit later, okay, just generally. But the thing is that they are transmitted via contact, so because on our skin we have the staph, we shed skin constantly, okay? The grey stuff in our vacuum cleaners, that's mainly skin. Is everyone just grossed out? Welcome to infection control. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the whole career of gross out. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so, so the, the organism, the MRSA or the staph aureus, the good, the good staph, um, can actually be on the skin swarms that we shed constantly. Okay, so I'm probably shedding all over the place right now. Okay, I'm not, I have no idea how often this stuff's cleaned. <laughs> um, but um, I could be, you know, if I had MRSA, it could end up here. If one of you had a wound or something, you touch this, then you, you know, put it on your hand or your skin, you could become colonised with the organism and you could end up with an infection. But there is a difference between colonisation and infection. An infection versus a colonisation, we're colonised all the time, no signs and symptoms of infection. I have no fever, I have no temperature, yeah, I have no fever, no temperature. Um, no other signs and symptoms, no swelling, no pus, no nothing, okay? All more good. But if I have a cut which becomes infected with an even normal staph, I'm going to have potentially a fever. There's going to be signs of inflammation, okay? Potentially pus, swelling, all those things, that is an infection. So you might find when you're working that you'll have a patient who might have be colonised even with MRSA or one of the other antibiotic resistant organisms. They may not have an infection, they're just colonised. Problem is that they still pose a threat to other people. And so normally we have to isolate those patients and put extra precautions into place to prevent the transmission of the colonising organism to other patients or yourself. Vector-borne. So it's things like from water, uh, fleas and animals. Can someone give me some diseases? Plague. Yes. Rabies. Yes. Malaria. Big one. Yep. Hendrovirus. Perfect. Yeah. So these are all vector-borne diseases. So they're coming from other animals. Some of them would then be person-to-person -person transmission afterwards. Okay. So you have to be careful with them. Uh, and blood and body substances. So body fluids, contamination, uh, or contaminated equipment. So what kind of diseases are we looking at there? Hepatitis B, yes. STIs are more contact, actually. Some of them, some of them do fall into blood and body substances. It depends how we're categorising them. But individual diseases, not grouping. So STI is sexually transmitted infections. Yeah, not just one type. Yeah. So Hep B, AIDS. Okay, so... AIDS is actually the syndrome that happens from a specific disease, okay? So HIV is actually the disease, okay? It's the pathogen. AIDS is what the syndrome becomes. That's how it presents at sort of end stage and so forth. Okay, so, okay, hep B, HIV, Ebola. Hmm, Ebola's interesting. <laughs> but, yes, mainly blood, blood and body substances, yep. Yeah. Can be a little bit other things, yep, yeah, but mainly blood and body substances. So we've got HIV, Ebola, Hepatitis B. There's one big one, another one that we worry about particularly. It's another type of Hepatitis C, yeah. 
So we have the three that we can, you know, continually worry about, which is HIV, Hep B, and Hep C. When we call look at bloodborne substance, um, sorry, bloodborne transmission. All right, so Hep B, Hep C, and HIV. And you will have all been immunised for Hepatitis B, yes? Yes, good. Okay, so you guys don't have to worry about that. Okay, um, but Hep C and HIV you still have to worry about as healthcare workers. Okay, not just so, you know, transmission to other patients, but to yourself as well, from needle stick injuries and occupational exposures, okay? All right, so to deal with all of this, we have specific infection control guidelines that come from the Australian government, okay? Um, now, this is really important for your assignment. So just take note of this, okay? <laughs> okay, so those guidelines are really important. So they guide the entire Australian healthcare system on how we do infection control in Australia. All right. Um, then we also have these safety and quality health service standards, and in particular, the relevance of standard three. Okay, standard three within these healthcare service standards um, is extremely important. That is how infection control programs are developed and enacted basically in every healthcare facility in the country. And it's not only things like big acute health facilities like across the road, we're also looking at clinics, GP practices, things like that. These all sort of, they all fall under this basic standard, okay? And those infection control guidelines. So when you get a chance to get, have a look at the, this PowerPoint properly, you'll be able to see the links to those actual guidelines, the guidelines and the standards. Okay, so we have two types of precautions that we, we focus on when it comes to infection control. And this again is everywhere. Okay, even in the community. So standard precautions are those precautions that we take for absolutely everybody, regardless of what we know about their immune, sorry, their infectious status. Okay, we treat everybody the same, everyone. Now I'll, I'll say this out loud. Does anyone know if I've got a bloodborne virus? Do I look fairly healthy? Okay, how do you know I don't? How do you know anyone in this room doesn't? The thing is with bloodborne viruses, everyone, people who carry a bloodborne virus or infected with a bloodborne virus can look completely healthy. So basically why we use standard precautions and we use this to protect ourselves and other people against bloodborne viruses is because we can't tell. They're not coughing, they're not sneezing, okay? They don't have fevers necessarily, okay? Everyone could potentially have a bloodborne virus. I remember I was, um, well, I was really sick once and I was, had to go to the ED because I was like completely dehydrated, I've been that sick. I was being, um, uh, I was in the ED and they said, okay, we need to give you some fluid. Like, okay, please, that would be nice. Um, so the nurse came towards me to cannulate me. She didn't have any gloves on. Okay, I'm sitting there and I've got my arm out and I'm like pretty sick. Husband's sitting next to me. He's actually, he's a doctor. Anyway, he's sitting next to me and I'm putting my arm out and I said, are you going to put some gloves on? And, and my husband's like, oh my God, really? And the nurse goes, why? Do you have something? And I'm like, well, not that I'm aware of, but how do you know that? So the thing is that this nurse, and I had a chat to her later about why she did it once I'd had the two litres of fluid and I felt a little bit able to speak properly, um, was that I had a chat to her about it and the thing is that she said to me that the reason she doesn't wear gloves, she put gloves on once I said, are you going to put gloves on? Uh, um, uh, she said that the reason she didn't put the gloves on initially was because she found it hard to feel the veins without the, with, with gloves on. Okay. The problem is that with that is that we really as clinicians, we need to learn how to do these things with PPE on, okay? Because if she had a needle stick injury from me, God forbid I had a, a bloodborne virus at the time, she could potentially have gotten something or be at a greater risk of getting something. Yeah, if you're wearing gloves, it's still going to go through the glove, but it will actually remove a lot of the bio burden before it gets to her, okay? That's why we wear PPE. All right, so it's just really important to remember that you never know who could have a bloodborne virus, so you know you need to take the same precautions, okay, regardless of what you know about a patient, okay. And this is about bloodborne viruses, so any blood or body substance, you need to use standard precautions, blanket rule. You basically discriminate against everyone, okay? Everyone gets PPE. 
when it comes to blood, you know, blood and body substances. That's it. Blanket rule. If you're emptying a catheter, you put eye protection on. Okay? You put things on that will actually protect you from a splash injury or a needle stick injury or any sort of injury that could come from blood or body substances. Alrighty, so that's standard precautions. And then we have this other thing called transmission-based precautions. But when you have transmission-based precautions, it's no, you know whether a patient may or even be suspected of having something that's transmitted by contact, droplet or airborne routes or a combination of them. So contact, airborne or droplet routes or a combination of them. But because you're doing this doesn't mean you stop doing that. You still need to do this. Standard precautions is standard for everybody. Transmission-based precautions is used in addition to standard precautions. Okay? Okay, so what we cover off in standard precautions is <coughs> they should be used for the minimum use in handling of blood, all body substances, okay, excluding sweat, regardless of whether you can see blood or not. Okay, because you can have, I mean, blood is small. Blood cells are small, okay, and it's not always visible. Okay, don't assume that there's no blood in something just because you can't see it. Um, non intact skin, so anybody who's got a wound, okay, any type of wound, that's always an issue. And mucous membranes, okay, so eyes, mouths, these are mucous membranes, okay, genital urinary tract. Mucous membranes, okay? These are all portals of infection, but also able to transmit infection as well. All right. So all the body substances secretions, that's urine, that's feces. Doesn't it matter how old the person is? The cute little baby, okay, could potentially have something. All right. So you still need to use personal protective equipment to put a barrier between you and the patient and break the chain of transmission. All right. So, and, you know, I had a patient once, another 90-something-year-old lady who had another, well, she had a fractured knot, so neck of femur. Um, staff member um, who had a needle stick injury from this lady. Um, she was, yeah, like I said, really quite, yeah, an elderly lady. We did, did the usual body fluid exposure protocol and all that sort of stuff. We found out that this patient actually had hep C. This woman had absolutely no risk factors whatsoever, but she'd had a blood transfusion earlier in her life before we were screening for hep C. See what I mean? We don't know who has it and who doesn't. But that's what I mean. Age doesn't make a difference, okay, or what you think you know about a person, okay? Just have to be careful. Okay, so PPE is the biggest thing that we use um, in all most commonly used things in standard precautions, hand hygiene. Anyone know what the five moments of hand hygiene are? Okay, so the five moments of hand hygiene, you need to know this off the, off the top of your head. Um, safe use and disposal of sharps. So when we're using a sharp, we dispose of it safely. Environmental cleaning is actually really important. Okay, like I said, I don't know how often this has been cleaned. I've been trying not to touch my face. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, environmental cleaning is important. And more often than not, just using soap and water will kill most viruses. Okay, so just a, a good old-fashioned detergent. You ha don't have to get the Glen 20 out, okay? Um, soap and water, but also making sure that you use friction, okay? And that's also a really important thing with hand hygiene. Just splashing some water on, splashing some soap off, and then soap on, and then just rinsing it off. That's not going to do anything. Friction, okay? It's actually the mechanical removal of the organisms and, the, and whatever's on your hands or on a surface. I really need to wash my hands now. Um, that is how you will remove it. Okay, just spraying something, or even alcohol hand rub to a certain extent, okay, it just kills everything on the surface. You still might have viable virus, viable bacteria underneath that sprayed surface. Okay, please be mindful of that next time you're watching Gwen 20 ad. Okay, <laughs> um, all right, uh, reprocessing of reusable medical items. So these are things that you don't necessarily have to worry about unless you're planning to work in a CSSD or an operating suite so much. Um, but there is a real, we're extremely stringent about how equipment is reprocessed, particularly after surgery or sterile items which can be reprocessed, okay? But it has to go through these stages. You have to clean something before you can disinfect it Okay, or sterilize it. It has to be cleaned. Okay, otherwise you're just 
trying to sterilise dirt. Okay, you have got to clean it. Again, it's that mechanical movement, the friction that will remove the biological burden from the surface, from your hands, from the equipment that will actually remove the actual organism and then you can sterilise it. If you've got biological matter on a piece of equipment that's going into a steriliser, that thing's not clean, it's not sterile because there still potentially could be viable organism underneath it, the biological burden. It might be sterilised on the outside, okay, but underneath, next to the metal, that could be viable. And there are organisms which will withstand normal sterilisation processes. Okay, Chris Jacob disease is an example, or mad cow disease. Alrighty, um, then we have respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. Where do we cough? Cough into your elbow, okay? I did this once to my son, I, was, I said to him, yeah, okay, sweetie, can you just don't cough into your hands? Can you cough into your elbow? And he goes, oh, like this? And I'm like, what, what do you mean like this? And he goes, I wasn't with it. And he goes, like, you like, you dab? And I'm like, what? <laughs> So usually people get it when I say that you do this and you, yeah, anyway, younger people get it, I don't know. <laughs> so you, next time you think about coughing, think dab, okay, put it into your elbow, okay. Why do you think this is a good spot? Because you barely touch it, yeah, and this doesn't come into contact with many things or anyone very often at all. Okay, all right, good. All right, um, if you do cough into your hands or anything like that though, please just make sure you hand, clean your hands afterwards. Any tissues and things like that, make sure that they're disposed of. Use hand hygiene. Um, now the cough etiquette, of course, is don't cough over anybody, those sorts of things. I'm, now I know you're going, okay, this is like stuff I should already know because it's common sense. Watch people for a while. Just sit in a cafe and watch what people do when they cough and they sneeze. Okay, <laughs> Okay. Uh, it's a bit frightening. Um, so again, common sense is not necessarily common, all right? Okay, aseptic non-touch technique. You will learn this in, a, in, a, in more detail later, but this is actually a really key thing. And with Glenn's story, it was a really key thing in regards to him having uh, central lines and Hickman's lines particularly, okay? All right, again, this is about us not introducing an organism into with somewhere there's a hole that should not have been there in the first place, okay? Or inserting something into a hole that we shouldn't be putting things into, okay? So urinary, you know, urinary catheters, okay? We don't really need, need, meant to stick things up urethras, no, but we do. The equipment that you're using is sterile, you have to maintain that sterility. Okay, and there's a reason it's sterile because we're not introducing organisms into the patient. Okay, this is all infection control. Okay, appropriate waste management and handling of linen. Okay, basically it's making sure that the, the waste goes in the appropriate bins. Um, so you'll have general waste, clinical waste, uh, you'll have sharps waste, you'll have cytotoxic waste and all those sort of things. I don't really worry about them too much. But things like clinical waste is usually, and the definition from the Environmental Protection Agency is that if you could squeeze it, whatever you've got that's contaminated and something drips out of it, then it goes into clinical waste. When I first, when this new definition came out, this is when in the beginning of my career in infection control, I said, I don't know how many nurses are gonna go squeezing a pad to see if it's gonna come out. And they're like, oh, anyway. <laughs> um, so just use your own discretion around that, okay? If it's heavily contaminated, put it in the clinical waste, okay? Just be mindful that that is the actual definition. Okay, and equally with our linen, you need to make sure that contaminated, so heavily body substance contaminated linen is separated from your general linen as well. Okay, you will find that why do we do this in some situations? I know a hospital I used to work with, all the, all the linen would get picked up, it was all segregated by us at the hospital, then it would get taken to the laundry and it all get thrown in together anyway. Because they had systems in place to make sure every, they had this level of everything got, a, got treated the same way just like all contaminated linen got treated the same way. So anyway, all right, hand hygiene. Just please note, this will be assessed throughout your nursing degree. When you're on placement, if you don't comply with infection control on placements, you could get hauled off. If you don't practice good hand hygiene, okay, if you're in the labs, when you're doing OSCEs, if you don't practice hand hygiene, you're gonna lose marks because it is taken so seriously, it's a patient safety issue. So hand hygiene, be on top of it. All right, so um, let's have a look. 
So I usually show this to my, because I, I teach the medical students as well. And I love showing the medical students this because, where is it? Okay, so registered nurses, midwives, that's us. Okay, doctors, nurses, doctors, nurses, doctors. But, <laughs> like I said, my husband's a doctor. Um, but, uh, where is it? I'm trying to find it. Student doctor, registered doctor, student doctor, registered doctor. See, there's actually a difference here. What happened? I point this out to the medical students all the time. And I say, okay, so students, you do really well at hand hygiene. Somehow that just, you get your degree and it doesn't happen anymore. Student nurses and midwives, that's us here. Nurses and midwives, not so much of a drop. It actually improves when you're registered, according to this. So it doesn't work for doctors, but it works for us. Okay, all right. So <laughs> um, I just find that's interesting that we, we have good compliance with hand hygiene with students, with student medical staff, um, but not so much with the actual registered medical practitioners. So I love telling them that. Anyway, I want to see it a couple of times. Like, so yeah, as you can see it here, nurse compliance 88.3, doctor compliance 74.1. That's a significant difference. Having said that, nurses are usually having more hands-on with the patients than a medical officer, but then you think they're more likely to not wash their hands because they're doing so many things all the time. All right, alcohol hand drive, everyone knows what this stuff is. Yeah, you see it everywhere. Okay, so alcohol-based hand drive for healthcare facilities must be 70% alcohol. Okay, anything less is actually not appropriate. So if you see alcohol in a healthcare setting, you won't see it across the road, definitely not. Um, but in other health facilities where they're using like 60% alcohol, it actually doesn't meet WHO standards. Okay, it has to be 70%. Okay, um, a lot of the time we get um, students, healthcare workers saying that the alcohol hand rubs dry their skin out. The likelihood is actually quite low. There's usually something else going on as well, okay? And a lot of people will say with their, um, even the types of soaps that they use, they, they get a contact dermatitis, not necessarily. It's usually a problem on how they're washing their hands. Now, the thing to remember here is also alcohol hand rubs will not work against certain organisms and you have to wash your hands. Clostridium difficile, okay, which is a gastro, like a, an enteric bug, okay? It's a spore forming organism you don't use alcohol hand drop because it won't work. Okay, they are alcohol resistant. Okay, spores are generally alcohol resistant. So if you have an organism which forms spores, you won't kill it by using alcohol. So you have to wash your hands to remove it. So that one and the other one that we worry about is norovirus as well. We generally recommend hand washing above alcohol hand drop. Okay, or if you want to wash your hands, then use some alcohol hand drop. Okay, so there is a real difference between how it can look before and after a hand wash, okay? The idea is that you will remove the microbiological or, um, burden off your skin. So this is something that we do a lot with, um, like, in educations and in services, is we actually get people to plate their hands to see if anything is growing. We don't go and type what it is, okay? There's a very good reason for that. <laughs> um, it's the first rule of surveillance. If you find an organism, you need to be able to do something about it. And if you go looking for it, you'll find it, believe me. <laughs> okay, we don't wanna go saying, oh, everyone's got MRSA on this ward. No. <laughs> um, so what we do is we just do this because even if someone does have MRSA on their hands, they're probably gonna just wash it off if they wash their hands properly. MRSA in health, on healthcare workers' hands is usually not a permanent colonization. Okay, it's just something that's there is actually very temporary. As soon as you wash your hands, it's gone. Okay, and that's why hand hygiene is so important. Okay, so that's really important. The same thing can be found. You can see similar sorts of results with cleaning equipment. And that's why we need to wash equipment or clean equipment between patients. Even sphygmomanometer cuffs should be wiped down from one patient to the next. Thermometer probes, one patient to the next because it could look like this before it's cleaned 
and before it goes to the next patient. So if you clean it, it's going to look a bit more like that, or nothing. Okay, the PPE, pretty much everyone's familiar with this stuff. So you've got your gloves. Everyone's really good at wearing gloves, probably a little too good. Overuse is a problem. Gloves do not mean you don't wash your hands. You remove the gloves. You don't go to put another pair of gloves straight on. You clean your hands. You put a new pair of gloves on if you have to. Wearing gloves does not preclude you cleaning your hands, all right? Because we do see a lot of overuse of gloves. We'll see people going from patient to patient with the same gloves on. Yeah, I know everyone's going, Ew. okay. Yeah, it is gross, Yeek. all right? But it happens, all right? Because they think, oh, no, my hands are clean. Yeah, you're, well, they're not really. <laughs> um, but those gloves are definitely not clean, all right? So it is really important. And the reason we say you do need to clean your hands in between the glove changes is because not only is there like a residual stuff inside the gloves that, you know, has anyone taken gloves off after a while and they feel really grotty and grainy and bleh? Yep, there's that. But the other thing is, and so you want to wash that off, but the other thing is that there's usually micro tears. There can be like little micro holes that stuff could have actually potentially got through. Really rare, but it does happen in the manufacturing process sometimes. Okay, sterile gloves are a bit better, better quality, but your stuff that you get off the wall in the wards, they're pretty cheap, pretty cheap and nasty, but they'll do the job of protecting you, okay? But you still wash your hands. Your skin underneath those gloves is still the most important barrier. So aprons or gowns as well, uh, eye protection or goggles and visors. This is a really good place to get a, a blood-borne virus. You don't want to splash to the eyes or the nose or the mouth, even the ear. Has anyone ever had a splash of a urine or feces to their face? It's not pleasant. You really want to prevent it. So, and you might not even think it's going to happen, but if there is any risk of you being exposed to blood or body substance, wear the PPE to prevent that exposure. This is a lot of risk assessment on your, on your part. You have to risk assess it. But you are at risk of getting a bloodborne virus from a splash injury to the eyes, particularly. Okay? Mucous membranes are really good at transmitting things. Influenza is a perfect example of that, actually. Okay, masks, that's basically to protect your, from a standard precautions perspective, pre preventing any transmission through your mucous membranes. Uh, respirators, they're more for your um, airborne organisms. And footwear. Footwear is mainly around uh, wearing enclosed shoes doesn't mean shoe covers, okay? There's only these very specific situations like the operating suite that you would be wearing shoe covers, okay? But having enclosed shoes. I did look after a medical intern once. She had lovely sandals on one day. She take, you know, done a cannulation, missed the sharps container when she was disposing of it, and it ended up in a foot, the actual sharp from the cannulation. I really wish these stories weren't true. Okay, but she had lovely sandals. Okay, if she'd been wearing leather shoes, like covered, covering her foot, it wouldn't have happened. It probably would have bounced off. That's why wearing enclosed shoes is so important. Okay, but it's also splashes and things because we just don't want that stuff between our toes. All right, so, all right, now what I'm going to tell you around personal protective equipment on how to put it on and take it off or what order. The kind of thing you're seeing on the screen here is what we would use for additional or transmission based precautions. So how you put it on, not so much of a problem as long as you are still, you are completely covered. One pro tip, always leave gloves to last because it's really hard to tie up things or you tie anything up with gloves on, okay? Just, uh, that's just a logistical thing. Always leave your gloves to last and make sure that you are completely covered. If someone can check you, that's even better. Now, removing it. You are going to see, through your career, multiple versions on how to best remove your PPE. This is the Australian guideline. The United States CDC have a different one. The World Health Organization has a different one. It's my life really hard when I do outbreak response because I have to pick one. It's usually WHO because that's who I'm working for at the time. Um, but what is really important here is that you take your mask off last. That, and also, if you've got a buddy system, someone who can just check your PPE to make sure that everything's intact, you, you haven't got hair stuck behind, behind your masks, that sort of stuff, it's always a really good idea. One thing we learned from SARS was inappropriate use of PPE, and particularly taking the PPE off caused most healthcare worker infections. <laughs> All right, again, um, cleaning of equipment is really important. 
Uniforms before shift, after shift. Wash your clothes. Okay? You don't want to be going back to the ward looking with this the next day. All right? Make sure you've got enough gear, enough uniforms to get you through a week or you can throw them through the machine. You don't have to do anything special with your machine, okay? Or you don't have to have that Dettol stuff or anything like that, okay? Soap and water friction. Your machine will take care of it. It can be cold water. It'll be fine. Don't have to do anything special. You don't have to throw, yeah, dead oil or nappy sand in everything. All right. Now, there's waste management. That's what I was talking about before. Generally, this is general waste, your clinical waste, Sharps containers. So there are examples of Sharps containers in Australia. We're lucky we actually have actually an Australian standard, Australian New Zealand standard, sorry, for Sharps containers. And they have, like, they have to be yellow. They have to have the biohazard symbol on it, all this sort of stuff, OK? If anyone goes and works in a lower middle income setting, you're lucky you've got a box, OK? Anyway, um, but we work, we get around it. Um, and this is, the purple is cytotoxic waste. All righty. Now, um, with your sharps, the first thing I ever want to say about sharps use is that if you are the person who used the sharp, you are responsible for disposing of the sharp. No one else. If you see your colleagues going, oh, or anybody, like literally anybody, who says, oh, sorry, the nurse can clean that up. No, whoever. <laughs> you know where the sharp is. Can you at least get rid of the sharp for me? Here's a sharps container. You take care of that, OK? Because there's been so many sharps injuries that I've dealt with over the years that have had, there's been sharps on a dress, on a kit of some sort, someone's walked away to go write up notes or something or do something and they've said, oh, can you just clean that up? They've gone to start grabbing things and they've not known where the sharps are. So they've gone to grab stuff and they've ended up with needle stick injuries. That is why we always maintain, if you are the person, and I tell our medical students this as well, if you are the person who generates the sharp, you are the person who's responsible for disposing of the sharp. And if someone's like, oh, no, 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 just grab a sharps container and take it to them and say, can you just get rid of that? I'll take care of the rest. All right, so making sure the sharp actually makes it into the container and doesn't fall out of the container as well. Another sharps injury story. Um, had a, a cleaner who um, ended up with a sharps injury to the leg. The cleaner was carrying a rubbish bag which had a sharp in it and it stabbed her in the leg. Do cleaners generate sharps? No. Should they be responsible for disposing of sharps? No. Okay. When we worked out what we actually tried to work out what went wrong here, what we found was that the sharps container that where this incident happened on the ward in the treatment room, the sharps container was on bracketed, it was all, you know, in the right spot. Problem was the general waste bin was right underneath it. So whoever, and it would have been a complete mistake, someone has thought they'd put it into the sharps bin and it's jumped, it's bounced out and ended up in the general waste bin. Cleaners picked up the bag to take away. They've ended up with a sharps injury. Like I said, I really wish I didn't have these stories. But that's how things like this do happen. So when we're disposing of sharps as clinicians, we have to be really mindful to make sure that it's gone in. Again, it's about protecting each other as well. All right, so there's all sorts of different types of um, safety devices in sharps these days, OK? Some that you have to um, make, you know, withdraw the needle. Some that will just automatically withdraw those sorts of things. Just get used to them. Use them. Okay, wherever you go, there's going to be something a little bit different. Okay, but you just have to get used to them. Please use any safety device that's given to you. Okay, it's actually part of workplace health and safety reg legislation that if you are provided with equipment to make something safe, you must use it. If you don't use it and something happens, you don't have a leg to stand on. Okay, because your employer has provided the equipment, so you can't make a claim against them for workplace health and safety, all right, unless there's something else involved. But generally speaking, if the employer provides the equipment and you choose not to use it, you can't make a claim so much. However, despite the best of intentions or practice, needle stick injuries still occur. In the event that a needle stick injury occurs, remove your gloves and perform first aid. The first step is to wash and rinse the site that's been injured.
Once you've concluded flushing the site, you will report the incident to the supervisor. The appropriate forms will be completed and you will be advised to attend ED for further management. So let it bleed, wash it and report it, okay? So your responsibilities as a healthcare professional, make sure you stick to clean clothes, bare below the elbows. Everyone understand what that means? Okay, so making sure that you are bare below the elbows. Am I bare below the elbows? To the elbow? No, I've got rings on, I've got a brangle on. They shouldn't be there. All that has to go, all right? No jewellery, okay? Also, anything that is um, longer, we need to push it up when we're providing clinical care and washing our hands and so forth. Need to keep it bare below the elbows. Hair tied back neatly, enclosed leather shoes, okay? Uh, make sure that you've got intact skin. Like we said at the beginning, your skin is your most important defence mechanism, okay? If you have a wound or a cut or an abrasion or something, you cut yourself while in the garden on the weekend, just get one of those clear plastic dressings, like opsites they're called usually, just to, just to seal it up, okay? So you can still perform hand hygiene, and as it gets manky, just get a new one, okay, during the day. Uh, make sure your immunizations are up to date. That includes influenza. So you've all done mandatory requirements and so forth, so don't really need to tell you about this, but influenza as well, okay? Um, and also making sure that anytime you are travelling, make sure your immunisations are up to date for travel vaccines as well, okay? Sort of just an aside. Uh, respiratory etiquette, diarrhoea and vomiting. If you have diarrhoea and vomiting and you're on clinical placement, after 48 hours after your last symptom, do not go back to the clinical placement, do not go back to work, okay? Because you still could shed, all right? So please, if you have diarrhoea or vomiting, don't go to placement. If you have a, uh, a respiratory illness, okay, please just stay away from clinical placement or work or whatever, okay, because again, you've got patients who have got comorbidities who really don't need influenza. Influenza vaccinations will work to a point, okay, you might be unlucky and get a different influenza. All right, so you have specific personal protective equipment to go with these different types of organisms, okay? The one that's more specific than any other is the airborne precautions, okay? Because you will need a very particular type of mask to be effective, okay? Now, these masks are, um, will filter up to 0 0.05 of a micron, okay? So these are for airborne precautions. Remember, with airborne precautions, as a healthcare worker, we're protecting our airways. So when we're breathing in, we want something here to prevent anything getting to our airway. All right, so like organisms like TB, which was mentioned before, varicella, measles, all organisms which require a very special mask called an N95 or a P2 mask, okay? These look a little bit different to each other. Like they, well, they look different to regular masks. But it's mainly because they provide such a good seal around your mouth and your nose, okay? And to know that you're actually wearing one properly, you should be fit tested and then fit checked, okay? So when you go to a facility and when you're working there full time, you'll probably, when you finish and graduate and everything, they'll probably fit test you to find out which mask suits your face the best, okay? And then every time you put one of these masks on, you still have to perform what's called a fit check. Okay, and that's to make sure that the seal is working well. Okay, and no air is getting in or out around the sides. Okay. All right. Um, with transmission-based precautions, usually these patients are kept in isolation from the rest of the general population. Okay. Airborne precautions, we do require a special type of air handling. Does anyone know what that is? Because if you're under airborne precautions, the air is infectious. Where do you want that air not to go? Out of the room. Okay. So there's this particular type of air handling called negative pressure, which means that the air is sucked out of the room through HEPA filtration and out of the building so that the air is not allowed to go out into a corridor or into any other patient area. Okay. Usually these rooms will have an airlock on the outside, so they'll have an ante room and then they'll have the patient's room. Most of the major facilities in Queensland, we do have uh, negative pressure isolation rooms, at least in the ED, probably the ICU, and the, these are the big centres, um, and then more than likely one or two on the wards. Um, 
as soon as you get away from the east coast, there's none. Okay, so Roma Hospital has no negative pressure. Okay, but for example, across the road, we've got about half a dozen or more. Yeah, depending on where you are. Yeah. Um, but for the other patients who are not requiring airborne precautions, single room with their own ensuite is usually the way we go. Unless you have a number of patients when you know they have the same organism, and then we can actually take up rooms. So have four people in a room sharing, an on, sharing a bathroom, and that's called cohorting. But we have to be sure that it is the same organism, not any guesswork. You have to know. So we do cohort every so often. MRSA patients, for example, are often cohorted. Vancomycin-resistant enterococci patients also cohorted often, and ESBL, sometimes norovirus, and Clostridium difficile. They're the more common ones that we would cohort because we know what they've got. It's pretty easy to tell. Influenza, we do that too. Um, with these rooms, you will have to have enhanced cleaning, so the cleaning is up to even more. Now, one thing I want you to do when you're working in any facility is make friends with the cleaners. The cleaners are actually key to infection control in any healthcare facility because the environment becomes so heavily contaminated that them not doing their job is actually a problem. Okay? Cleaning services have got to be on the ball. And so that's why environmental cleaning is actually one of the most important aspects of a healthcare facility. All right, so don't ever think that they're in a lesser position to you. They've got just as much a role of tra preventing transmission of infection as you do. I know in my role as an infection control professional, I can't do my job without working with the cleaners really closely, particularly in an outbreak. So they are absolutely essential and they're, really, they're a key component of every infection control committee in every healthcare facility. Okay, and we always try to restrict movement of patients as well. Okay, so these are some examples of um, types of signs you might see on the outside of a door, okay, if someone is under extra precautions or transmission-based precautions. So you have definitely will have one for airborne, droplet and contact, okay. Um, sometimes they might put extra bits on. It just depends on the facility. Okay, but usually these are on the doors before you go into the patient's room. Okay, you can usually also tell, because usually there's a little trolley, which will have these stocks with gowns and gloves and uh, masks and eye protection and stuff like that. It's usually a good giveaway. Someone's under some type of precautions, even pr protective precautions as well, potentially. Some patient conditions require us to isolate them. In this instance, we use additional precautions in addition to standard precautions. Isolation signs will be in place for anyone who's isolated in a single room. The correct PPE to attire will be ticked on these signs. Today we're going to put the attire on for Clostridium difficile, which would be contact precautions. The first thing that we do before we enter a room is to perform hand hygiene. Today we are going to use the alcohol-based hand rub prior to entering the room. It's the same technique that you would use for performing your hand hygiene by washing your hands. Once you've done that, you're going to don your apron if you have a short uh, business shirt or blouse or if you're wearing long sleeves you need to actually attire a long sleeved gown. In a large group, you can actually assist each other by tying the necktie and the waist tie. Secondly, you apply gloves. And if you're having direct contact with the patient, goggles. Ideally, any 
extraneous equipment needs to be left outside the room. If you are going to be using your stethoscope, prior to entering, we need to clean the stethoscope with a toughie.